I was, because I was an ex-fighter, they let me work out with the kids. The kids couldn't work themselves, I mean, because they'd, they'd be fighting all the time. So we'd, I'd box with each one of them, if they were on the top level, which you would all get. I knew, like, the next Tuesday we were going to fight. All of a sudden, they'd do well, because they, they wanted to. Some of them would be almost crying, and they they get so scared. But I said, once you start, you're not quitting. You've got to go three rounds or no. Tyson was real good. But them guys, one round, you gotta go to three minutes. You can't quit. You quit, then I will punch you. I'll punch you down or something like that, which I obviously would. But it was so neat. Some of the, some of the big, big, big kids, to Tay Jokins, I remember, and he's, he's, he's laughing. But it just, but they all, all went around. And everybody went to bed that night, no problems. They all, they're tired and they all went to sleep and stuff. Um, and that's my, that's boss was saying, did you ever notice about that? He says, there's never any problems those nights because they're all so excited initially and then when they get done, they're done and they go, and they go to sleep. Um, he heard about us, me working with the kids over there and he asked how to get into our cottage. And he said, just keep like a, keep acting like an idiot, like, like you are or something like that. So the next day, he moved up in school or something like that and I uh, physically got off with another kid and they sent him to us. And when he came, I remember that they walked through, two of the biggest staff on campus walking through the, uh, walking through the, from one cottage to the next. And he, we, I, we had two people watching him. He was in a room, it took everything out of the room for case of suicide and all that stuff. And he, so we waited from like, say he came over at four o'clock. We waited till like 11 o'clock when all, everybody else was in bed. Then we brought him over, they marched him over, put him in a room, locked the doors. And, uh, and then I went, I slammed, I would get fired if I, but I slammed the door open. I said, what do you want with me? He said, I want to be a fighter. I said, so the rest of these idiots. I said, if they want to be fighters, they wouldn't have come here in the first place. They'd be out in the streets, going to school, and going to the gyms after school. So you're probably just another one of them. Just, I really want to. I really want to change myself, but he, well, he wouldn't look me in the eye. He looked like this. He's so insecure, he couldn't look me straight on. It took like a, three weeks to retrust him before we could actually talk. I he slammed the door. I said, well, I'll talk to you in a few weeks. Let's see your behavior change and we'll see what happens. And I don't believe it'll change. It will, he says. Okay, so. Yeah. She completely changed the attitude. His, Teachers were calling up, what the heck happened? He went from a third to a seventh grade reading level in like a matter of two months, which and that was where we were supposed to be about. Behavior, the main thing was I said, I don't care if you flunk every subject, but you behave yourself in school. You don't do it, screw up so the other kids can't participate and stuff, or better themselves. Everything changed. After a couple of weeks of good behavior, then I started working with them. And I had to make sure, he used 105, 696 pounds when I first met him. He says, Got my, my boss said, no, you know, sure you can handle him so because I hadn't fought a couple years, but he, so I said, I'm all right with him. So I, the very first time I worked out was in front of the whole crew, all, all the kids. And I had to really, and I made a real fool. I made a miss or fall down and stuff like that. And I didn't hit him hard, but he said I did, but I didn't. And, but I made him, <clears throat> had to make a fool of him initially. So so his kids said, anyway, if your staff's still in charge, or the kids aren't taking over. And then, he said, what did I do wrong? Jesus, he's actually, I'm thinking to myself, he really much wants to try. I never let him know. I'm a tough guy, you know, I'm selling staff and something, but Jesus, this kid might want to try. So then anytime I'd show him something at night, because you know, I worked at nights, they he he practice and practice and practice, and the lights are out at eleven o'clock, and the third shift staff would say to me, he says, uh, he says, uh, he was up till three o'clock in the morning. He says, in the dark, in a locked room, he just was shadow boxing or whatever I showed him. And I said, well, did he give you a problem in the morning? No, nope, got right up and stuff like that. I said, I said, you tried. I said, and he got so good, I brought him to Albany one time to uh, Matt Priyansky gym. He looked at him, Matt looked at him, he said, yeah, he looks good. Nobody believed he was, uh, might have been 14 at that time, 13 or 14, he turned 14 in June. And they never said, get out of here, he's 18, 20 years old. I said, he's not. So I run, so then I called uh, Customato, and I asked Customato if I could bring him down to you. So 
we get this phone call from Bobby Stewart. He's a he's a prison guard. He was a former fighter, and he calls Cuz. He knows Cuz, and Bobby Stewart's twenty seven years old. He's a light heavyweight. He was a national amateur champ, also a a pro fighter. I think he had about twelve pro fights, and Tyson found out he was a boxer. Was a little interested. So he's doing a few things, teaching him a few things, making deals with him. Like, if you behave good, you know, uh, I'll maybe do a little boxing lessons with you. And doing what a prison guard and a decent human being would do, which is not only turn the key when the guy gets into the cell, but if he could also talk to him and see if there was some ways that he could help do what you're supposed to do when somebody's in a reformatory. It means reform, right? Reform. So, calls up, tells Cus. Cus tells me, he says, he's got this kid, this young kid wants to come down, want, wants us to take a look at him. We make arrangements. He brings him down. He's got to bring him in a little bit of a, the, the prison van because that's protocol. Mm-hmm. He brings him down and, you know, what are you going to see? Uh, we don't want to see him hit the heavy bag. That don't mean nothing. We know he's green and everything, but if you're going to see, you want to see what's inside, not just outside. You want to pick up the hood of the car. You don't want to just see the body. We did something that we wouldn't do again for months and months and months. We let him spar. See, we wouldn't do that again until we taught him properly. Right. But right now, to, it was all about an audition. And we had to see, like I said, we had to see thoroughly what was there, not just outwardly. Just not just a hundred and ninety pound twelve year old who was strong and had these physical assets. So he went in a ring and boxed with I didn't have anyone that size in the gym, so he boxed with Stewart, who I just described, former pro. And um but smaller than Tyson, but but twenty seven, Tyson's twelve. Alright, so we get in there. He was Perfect. Just with everything I showed him, you know, something like he, like he plugged him in, he did everything he's supposed to be slipping, moving his head. And I, I got to hit him pretty good to keep, keep keep him off me and stuff like that. And then the second round, middle of the second round, I caught him in the nose. It was no big deal, but his, his nose started bleeding and went all over his face. So after the second round, Teddy Atlas says, uh, I thought we saw enough. You know, his nose bleeding and stuff like that. And Tyson says, no, we, no, excuse me, said, but we, we have to go three rounds. Mr. Stewart says, once we start, we have to finish. That means I got to finish three rounds. And I looked over at Cuss, and his head was like, it, it just, like, all of a sudden, like, his blood pressure from nine million. And there's a couple of timers standing there looking. I said, I could just, I, I said, that was it. That's perfect. So we went the third round, and he was, he was good as ever. And so, again, like, I'm thinking maybe he'll let me bring him back again. So I, I, Cuss was taking my gloves off. And I said, what do you think of the kid? He said, what do I think about the kid? He said, barring outside distractions, if he is 13 years old, that will be the youngest heavyweight champion of all time. And, you know, you got Bobby Stewart boxing with him, and what you see is you see that Tyson is aware that it's an audition, and so he's trying to be aggressive. He's trying to impress us. He understands this. So he don't know exactly what's going on, but... Bobby has told him, you do good here. Maybe these people get involved in your life. So he knows there's something on the line that's pretty big. And my instincts started coming alive. I, I, I could even notice, not just the X's and O's and the physical moves, but I could notice that, as the kids would say, he was fronting. He was, he was trying to make me think that he was something that he thought I wanted to, I needed to think he was to say yes that I wanted to train him, that he was tough and he was he was aggressive and unafraid and all these things, and I could feel it that it was he was forcing himself to he was to show that, and but all that mattered at the end, they also understood that all that matters is he was doing it, that yeah maybe he was fronting, maybe he was putting on a show to show me, and he was uh, something that he wasn't inclined to always be, that he was a this and he was sure of himself and all those things but all that mattered was he was able to put forward that front he and by putting forward that front he was physically doing those things to put forward that front that's all that mattered 
that he actually was capable of doing it. So Tyson, when I first had him, he was 190 pounds, nothing but muscle, 12 years old. Okay, that's what he was. <laughs> but that's what he was. I mean, that's what God made right. him. That's so, crazy. So I go down there and I put the first fight. Nobody's seen Tyson. Nobody's ever seen Tyson. But 12 years old, zero fights. Blah, 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 blah. Okay. <laughs> Teddy! <laughs> now you go too far. Nelson, I'm not lying, okay? He's 12 years old. He's going to be 13 soon, but he's technically he's 12 years old, okay? Oh, come on. I said, all right, I'll make you feel better. I'll put down 17. Thank you. Now you tell the truth. I say he's not 17. <laughs> <laughs> but I knew what I had. Uh, you know, like right. I said, I knew what I had. He knocks this 17-year-old kid all out. And was that the first smoker he'd ever been to? Yeah. Okay. And he knocks him out. Pretty good fighter the guy was. Yeah. But Tyson's slipping. Bang! 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 I mean, it was like... In your mind, were you I thinking was, like, holy shit, yeah, this like kid is doing on it. I just was like, he's actually doing <laughs> what we trained to do. Holy, but with speed and power and precision. He learned very fast, very fast, like a sponge. And, and he's just very athletic. He's very talented. He's very quick. You know, forget about the power. He's got power in both hands. Uh, punches, as I've said on ESPN many times, are born and are made. You teach them the right way to get more leverage and more explosiveness and to get to the target faster. Um, but but you either have power or you don't. And you're not really going to make a great punch if he's not born to be a great puncher. And you you have to give the delivery system. You have to teach him the technical things to elude the other guy's punches and put himself in position to unload, like Gus said, to explode those bombs. Yeah. And and so you, you start teaching him the style, the technique, which I did every day. And inside, outside, you know, the whole thing, slipping punches. And there's a documentary out there if the people are interested. It's called Watch Me Now. You should see it, actually. You and Rob should look into it. It's called Watch Me Now. It was... After I had him a few years, we had him a few years, and he went into his first national tournament, the National um, Junior Olympics up in uh, Colorado, Colorado Springs, Colorado, uh, the United States Air Force Base. And he he went there. He was 14 years old, I believe, 14 or 15. I think he was 14. But whatever it was, the first year was 14, and it was two years in a row that I took him and that he won him. And he won them by first round knockouts in every fight. Let him hang there and stretch, like gradual. Feel the stretch. Feel it? Yeah. No, no, we punched. Made him miss a punch, might as well drop. This is the hardest part of boxing, you guys. The hardest part is the weight, right? Isn't that the hardest part? Once you get in there and you box, it's it's not as hard as the waiting. Because when you wait, you start thinking about things. You know what I mean? You're saying I'm gonna get beat. You know, no, no, you don't say that. You have to have confidence. Say I'm gonna win. But still, your mind starts to think of things. You know, but you just gotta be. You know, just have enough discipline to. So just go through it. Be a man. Michael, Mike! You're so nervous, you're getting farther and farther away. Loosened up your shoulder good? Yeah. All right, feels looser? Mm -hmm. Then you can start to loosen up a little faster. You can start to shadow box a little, especially when you feel the tension mount. Motion relieves tension. You're the champ. You're the champ. They're the ones who got to worry. If you weren't nervous, there'd be something wrong with you. That nervous feeling is a sign you're going to win. Sign you're ready. Right? Sign you're ready to win. Just got to keep it up here and go do it. Everything here is right. Just got to keep it up here. All right, champ. Champ.
Hey, cuz. Eight second knockout of the first round. Eight second knockout. Yeah, he said. The right hand. Yeah, he did. He set a new record. The official came over to him and said, you just, you just set a record. Fastest knockout ever. Yeah. Eight seconds. Like smart and like a tiger. Like a smart tiger. Only tiger but smart and calm. Yeah. With a left jab. Like an arm strong with a jab. And move your head. And cover. And once you get inside, set up the that's it. Set up those body punches. Concentrate on the body. Switch over, right? Yep. Okay. Use the eight. If he jabs, give him an eight. Plus, if he tries to run, give yeah. him eight. Use the eight. And if you run, track him down like a dog. Use the eight. You know? And, <laughs> and I remember one kid saying, that's Sonny Liston's nephew. <laughs> and their imagination against imagination. <laughs> the ninjas are and, coming. And the word got out. Next thing you know, there was a rumor around all true because we were staying where we, we had our housing, you know? Yeah. So we were staying there. So everybody's hearing things. And next thing you know, we're getting vans to go to the events. We would all get in a van. We'd go over together. And you'd hear these kids. We'd always be alone, me and Mike. We'd be in the front so by ourselves. And you'd hear the kids in the back saying, that's Sonny Liston's nephew. And what's Mike saying to you when he's hearing this? Is he saying, hey, no, Teddy, no, he you hear them? At, They're scared? But he knew. No, he knew. It's a good point, Ken. But he knew because of where he came from. He, he knew the, the, the law of the jungle, mm -hmm. so to speak. He, he understood Things that most kids at that age never would understand. Yeah, he he understood the strengths and weaknesses of people. He understood fear. He understood how it could be used. He understood how it, uh, it used him and destroyed him and made him hide. And he and now it was his turn to use it. Mm -hmm. And he, you know, he was going to be the. He wasn't. He was no longer the hunted. And so he would look at me when you'd hear the sunny listen craziness and he just looked at like he had a real and he knew he would keep a serious face because he wanted them to see that he wanted to perpetuate these stories and yeah, yeah so so he would he would take it and and use it and 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 let it run let it let it grow he wanted it to grow he wanted yeah. it, to, it could be helpful so he'd look like this and they would see that and then when he heard it he'd look at me and just a little <laughs> like, you know, just for a second, just for because he knew I knew. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. he had to kind of like. Look, 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 just relax, Michael. Relax, just relax. Just relax. Just relax. Relax. Yeah, but just relax. Just relax. I'm only first time. Yeah, well, just relax. Don't get so tense. Relax. All of this is another parking match. You've done it already 20 times. You've done it in the gym with better fighters than you're ever going to fight here. I mean, it's always hard, but I mean... Yeah, I came a long way, remember? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I'm like Tyson. Anybody likes me? Yeah, everyone likes you, man. That's right. You have reason to be proud. And you continue to do it as long as you don't let anything mess you up. As long as you don't let yourself mess you up. You continue to have people like you. Never just always remember, that's all. Just always remember, you, you know, to let your feelings get the better of you. I never. Don't let things mix you up, that's all. Prospect and a possible professional champion in years to come. 
He is also uh, being helped, trained by Custy Amato, the former uh, manager and trainer of uh, former heavyweight champion Floyd Patterson. You're the champ, fight smart and like a tiger in calm. Tyson has a great overhand right. Brown carries his left hand low. We'll see whether the two match up. There's the right hand. There's the left. A right He's left moving in. He's, He's got him in the corner. He's working on him. Right yeah, head goes up. He's going yeah. down. Another right touch of the body by Tyson. Very, very strong boxer touch. Very, very strong. Brown has taken some vicious punishment and held on. He's still in there. There's another right by Tyson. He's just uh, left right. He's giving up. The towel's coming in. Look at old Tyson jump on the ropes. That is it. They threw the towel in with the towel. He didn't want to say <laughs> Come on, come on. Uh, Michael, come on. Uh, come here, come here. Now listen, you got to act with respect. Come here, yeah, to your opponent. Hey, you got a lot of guts, too. Come here. Come here. You got a lot of guts, kid. You have a lot of guts. And you just stick with them. Don't let this discourage you. He's a two-time national champion. You stick with him, you're going to have your day. You understand? You have a lot of guts. Yeah, a lot of guts. Yeah, you got 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 a lot of guts. Me and him were a team. I, I, he, he was my, he, he was my responsibility. That's was, what I'm trying to understand was, is no, the, how was, like the relationship but was when things were just, early. Just, just, he was my kid. Yeah, he was my kid. And and but then you know kids go, kids can go different directions. Yeah, and they can test boundaries. Oh, and trust me, I know boundaries. He started testing boundaries, and he started finding out that that with me, he couldn't get away with things because it was my job not to let him get away. But at home with Cuz, you know, who knew he was going to be, this was going to be his last champion. Cuz knew that already. Yeah. Cuz knew things. He was smarter than me. He knew things. He was older than me. He knew this was going to be his last champion. And Cuz started making little concessions, but I didn't make them, not because I was stricter or better or harsher. Cuz was plenty harsh with him, everyone else throughout his life when he had to be. But it was just that I was regimented in. I For me, it was it was simpler for me than it was for Cuz. I wasn't 70 years or whatever it was at that time. I wasn't at the point that I'd been through a whole lifetime. I was a kid. I, I had a responsibility. It was it was it was simple. It was basic. It was black and white. It was A and B. It was real simple. It was go teach kids to be fighters, teach kids to grow up, teach kids to be stronger, to to teach kids to to, to be disciplined, teach kids to stand by the rules. I, I had rules where if you didn't didn't pass, if you failed two subjects in school, you added the gym. Yeah. I had rules, and for a reason. And get kids on the right track, on the right path. Lead kids. Be a leader. And and teach them the right things. Protect them. Teach them to get away from punches. But also teach them to make the right decisions. Teach them to... And if they don't, that there's repercussions. In the gym, in the ring, and outside. Teach them that. And so it was simple for me. It was simple. Seven days a week, I taught. Seven. That was my job. It was simple. It was complicated for Cus. He'd been through a lifetime of this, and that was about having one last champion. It was different. It was harder for him, easier for me. He didn't me, want to do anything to lose me, him, right? It was just simple. Like, you do something wrong, guess what? Then there's there's a there, there's an answer for doing something wrong. There's a repercussion for doing something wrong. Uh, this is what we're gonna do. You're out of the gym. Cus is thinking, well, well, wait a minute now. We can't throw him well, out. Wait a minute now. I didn't have a lifetime standing in the balance of things that it all came down to possibly one last shot. Yeah. I, I wasn't at that place in life. I was at a beginning place. Yeah. A jumping off place. And for me, it was easy to to, to understand that it was just, you, the kid abides by the rules. If you don't, I put him out there. For Cus, it was different. And Cus started making, he started making concessions. And I didn't understand it. He started compromising things. And 
the problem was that Mike was, he was a special kid. He was a special kid. He had his demons and everything else like we all do. But, and he came from this place, but he, he was special in a way, not just physically, but that he understood when somebody was being weak. He understood when you were getting where you could get away with certain things and you could manipulate certain things like he did from where he came from. Yeah. He, he understood how you could get an edge um, because you had a gun or you had a reputation. He understood what he had. Yeah. He had something now that he had something where it influenced Cuss, where he could, where he could, he could leverage it. He could move it. He could use it to an advantage for him to make things easier for him to have Cuss on his side. Yeah. He saw that and he played that. And, and it took us to a bad place. It took us to a dangerous place. So when it when it, when I heard about this from my kids in the gym, the thing that was disturbing was I wasn't hearing it from Cuz. Cuz had a had a direct pipeline with the principal and the vice principal. So I again it was simple for me. I just I put him out of the gym. When yeah. I found out these things, I put him out of the gym. Then Cuz put him back in the gym. And then we had a problem. Me and Cuz never had a problem. We yeah. never had a problem. Now we had a problem. But now it caused a problem with Tice because now he looked at him as the good guy and me as the bad guy. Yeah. But not really because he was too smart for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He knew the power he had. And and it, it led to him being defiant. And listen, I understood where he was coming from. Um I understood uh, the difficulties of his past where they could haunt him. I understood that. But I also understood that he needed to abide and by rules. And that was part of why he was coming from where he was coming from. And that if he didn't if we didn't have them abide by rules and respect other people. Because if you don't learn those things outside, you will not ever be anything inside. If you don't learn to control yourself outside, you'll never control yourself inside. To when the degree that we're, that we're responsible for taking him and teaching him. There's a famous story about you holding a gun to the head of Mike Tyson. What happened there? It's not important what happened there. It's important what led up guess that's where your question should be. What led up to that? Tyson had gone after a family member who was 11 years old, a girl. And he had been pushing the boundaries more and more and more. His restrictions or his care about how he treated other people became less and less. I put him out of the gym for his behavior in school, uh, what he was doing and threatening students and basically putting his hands on girls in the hallways, and he knew how to push those parameters. You know, he understood the streets, he understood those rules, those laws, he understood people in those ways, under those conditions, what he could get away with. Thinking that he could get away with uh, more and more improper behavior. And it pushed it into one day I, I come home and I find out that um, my wife and sister-in-laws are, are crying because of what he did to uh, an 11 year old girl in my family and, um, and took him on his word for the things that he said he wanted to do to the 11 year old girl. Uh, so in a sexual way. So I got a, I got a gun and I went and, I went and confronted him and uh, I told him, you know, you made a choice to do this, uh, whether or not you think that you're hurting me or you think you're sending a message to me, um, you did send a message to me. You sent a message to me, you don't give a damn about other people, that you don't care if you behave like an animal. I care. You want to do that to Cus's family? You want to do that to Camille's family, the woman who owned the house that he lived with? Obviously, maybe they allow that. I'm not allowing that. This, you will never do it again. You'll be dead if you ever do it again. There won't be a conversation. You won't be seeing me. 
you won't even know that there were repercussions. You'll just be gone. Understand that very clearly because it's important for my family and obviously for you. What's going through your mind when you pull a gun on Mike Tyson? That's a scary thing to do. Boom, you banged it in there. Um, you know what's scarier? Having an 11-year-old girl who had been approached by him, you know, and told by him what he was going to do to her. And um, knowing that and not doing something about that and not stopping that. Knowing that I could do something knowing that the next time he might rape her. Well, he probably will. I know that's tough for me, but hey, I, I have the right to say it because I lived it. And he did it partly out of meanness, out of, just out of direct, you know, uh, I use a strong word, stronger word than meanness, <laughs> evil uh, to a certain degree, that he wanted to get back at me, you know, because I had put him out of the gym and I was, you know, having that problem with Cuss and him over the disciplining of him. And, and that's the first time me and Cuss were at ends. We were partners, you know? And so he was doing that street thing, showing who's got the power. But so don't do it with my family. Don't do it with somebody innocent. Don't do it with somebody who can't protect themselves. Somebody who's weak. Don't do that, you know? Do it to me. Direct. And um, so when you say that, you know what was scary? What was scary was me living with that, not doing nothing about it. That's scary. And I'm not saying I condone it or good. I'm not proud of it at all. At all. At all. And God helped me and made sure it didn't happen. And I'm grateful for that. Because I wouldn't be here talking to a good guy right now. But... So I'm grateful for all that, and I'm cognizant of what it could have been. I am. But I'm also very calm, I'm not gonna lie about it. I'm cognizant that I wasn't gonna, I wasn't gonna feel, I wasn't gonna go in and hide because I didn't wanna face that because it was uncomfortable, it was scary, and it was scary. No, I was gonna do something about it and make sure that I did what I thought I had to do, protect my family at that time. You know, that goes to the same way I say these things to people and I can say it with reality behind it, with some strength behind it. It's harder to quit than it is to fight. It would have, you know, if I would have quit and just, you know, not done anything about it, I would have had to live with that. What would have came next? How I would have felt? And I, you know, I was willing to, I know it's it's. it's It's a stupid thing and maybe a selfish thing because it, my family would have suffered. But I was willing to suffer. I was willing to lose my life, whether it was through incarceration or whatever, to, to do what I thought had to be done at that moment. And um, you know, I put the gun in his ear and he didn't seem like he understood it at that moment. So I pulled it out of his ear and I pulled the trigger, uh, missing him on purpose. And he understood it after that. It, was, uh, it wasn't a threat. It was to make it clear that I wouldn't have to be in that position again, and either would he. And one thing that always bothered me and is what happened with Teddy Atlas. Mm -hmm. And I know you guys never talked again. And for people who don't know, Teddy accused Mike of saying something, as you acknowledged, inappropriate to his. Grabbed the, he grabbed his sister-in-law's butt. She was a young girl. Mike was a teenager. And then Teddy put a gun to your head and shot the gun next year. And he was then, t uh, Cuss kicked him out of camp. You never saw him again. Cuss never saw him again. And I know you never talked to him again. But as angry as that made you, I, I wonder how, how much it must have hurt you, too. Because he was, or did you always know oh, he no. didn't, did you think hey. he didn't care before then? Hey, um, I, um. I was sad when he did it. I wasn't even, I'm never mad. I never was mad at Teddy for that. I was never mad at Teddy for that. I was just so embarrassed that I did that to cause him to do that. I was never, ever mad at him to do that. It's just people, other reporters agitated it on and um, they pretty much, um, I don't know, made an um, uh, issue out of it. 
in the papers, and we both, I don't know, I felt in the school, so I wanted to tack back to show I wasn't a punk, but it was just all out of emotion and stuff, and um, I thought I deserved that. I'm mean, from the streets, and that's really what happens to people that do things like that. And maybe it wasn't right, but that was just the law that we lived by. So you understood that why he oh, did absolutely, it. Absolutely, absolutely. So why? So why haven't you talked then in twenty years? Why, why isn't? It, why aren't you able to bump into him? All the, in the fight game's not that big. Yeah, I see him. I used to see him a lot. Yeah. But you never had a conversation. No. Well, he has to know that I'm sorry, and I, you know he has to. Know, I'm not afraid of him, but he has to know that I'm really sorry. He from all the years that he known me, he has to know I fucked up and I'm sorry. You know, over the years we said bad things about one another, but he has to know that. I don't care how, what anybody's telling him in his ear, he's a bum, I'm this and that, but he has to know I'm fucking sorry. Did, did he help you as a fighter? Was he a oh, good absolutely. trainer? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, uh, it is Verona, New York. It's become a pretty big casino. I was there when it just started with ESPN. We did a lot of shows there, Friday Night Fights, a lot. And it was the Turning Stone Casino in Verona, New York. Yep. We're doing a show up there. It was Mike Tyson Promotions. Tyson had, had become a promoter. Not really, because somebody was paying him to use his name. And he's there in the house. I'm not thinking about it, really, to be honest. Yep. And I'm doing this show. I'm on the air live, corner fights, and all of a sudden, uh, you know, all of a sudden my producer says, listen, Ted, uh, and I'm in the middle of corner fight. He's talking to you over in your headphones. Yeah, my headphones. You know, you could do a talk back, so you could hit the talk yeah. back, but I can't do the talk back because I'm talking. <laughs> I'm, I'm doing the... Uh, Broadcast and all of a sudden he says, Teddy, don't want to. <laughs> he was the best. He goes, uh, Teddy, I don't want to distract you, nothing, but uh, uh, I just want to tell you, um, Mike Tyson's behind you. <laughs> 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 you know, like I said, I'm like, you know, I'm waiting to get to the talk back where I could, you know, like, you know, anybody got a pipe? <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> so, uh, you know, so I'm. Again, being a pro, like you talk about doing what you got to do and handling the moment. And so I keep doing a broadcast. And, you know, now I know he's. So now he's given me more information. Teddy, he wants to talk to you. He wants to. He wants. We're, we're being told by his people he wants to apologize to you. And it's a lot. It's a lot to digest while you're on the air, you know. Oh yeah, I'm sure. And and uh, you know the first part is he's standing behind you, <laughs> like <laughs> I wanted to hear like, and I couldn't. But uh, there was a part of me that wanted to say which side, <laughs> like <laughs> my is he behind my right shoulder or my left? Yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah, uh, you know like which w w give me more information. Don't just tell me Tyson's behind me, you know. But your nature takes over your instincts take over you just so i get up i turn around i i'm trying to remember if the round was still going on or if it was a break uh in the round i'm not sure maybe it was a break in the round we had waited long enough for the round to end or the fight to end but i i'm not sure anyway i get up i turn around and there he is and like i said i've been already told that he, you know, he wants to, you know, say he's sorry. And, you know, he didn't waste time. He's, there he is, standing right there. And he just said, I'm sorry. Hey, it takes a man to do that, you know, because, uh, you know, a lot of people said, why'd you, some people said, why'd you shake his hand? But uh, you do what you want to do and what you call it. You can't be perfect. I don't know if it's the right decision, but you want to make what you think is the right decision for everything that it represents for yourself your family yeah it's not just for you and uh so to me a lot of people ask was he sincere do you think he was sincere was it a you know it's a fair question do you think it was a tv moment was this that listen i don't know how sincere it was but i felt that it was and number two if a man is man enough 
to come back to you. He doesn't have to. When he comes back to you and he says, I'm sorry for what I did. I was. Uh, he actually said, I'm sorry, I was wrong. And if a man comes back and is man enough, at least, that's the way I'm that's all you can judge it by you can't go break it down and say but did he do it for the at that moment I believe what he was saying and it's it, it takes something to do that it does it takes something to do that on his part anyway I so I um I thought if he's putting his hand out man enough to put his hand out I better. I think I should be decent enough, man enough, whatever word, to to make a decision quick, and I, I accept it or not. And I, you know, I put my hand out. I accept it. He hugged me, and that's when he said to me, "I'm sorry, um, I was wrong." And it felt, I don't know. It um. I can't tell you, oh, it made up or did this or, because we were way past that. We were 100 million miles yeah. past that by now. And mm -hmm. all I could tell you is, you know, I don't know, like some people say somebody dies, you get closure, finally through something, whatever, or you try to get it, whatever. Uh, you go through that, whatever. Uh, he he said it, and it it felt real, it felt sincere, and I don't know, I, you could say it don't mean nothing, but it meant something. 